if you have your Bibles or your electronic equipment, whichever you use. Um, we do want to focus our thoughts for a few moments on the unlimited God. We're back in this series, the unlimited God, and today we want to look at the unlimited mission of God. And I, I trust I won't be before you very long because this is a two-part message. I, I, this had to be broken up into two parts or it would be very long. Uh, next week will be part two of the unlimited mission, God's unlimited mission. If you want to turn in your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Corinthians 5 and 20. 2 Corinthians 5 and 20. And as you're turning there, I want to share this. In 2006, a fictional story was published on a website, and this is how the story goes. Julie and Bob Clark were stunned to receive a letter from their church in July asking them to participate in the life of the church or worship elsewhere. They basically called us freeloaders, says Julie. We were freeloaders, says Bob. In a, it goes on to share that in a trend that may signal rough times for wallflower Christians, the faith community church in Winston-Salem has asked non-participating members to stop attending. No more Mr. Nice Church, says the executive pastor, newly hired from Singular Wireless. Bigger is not always better. Providing free services indefinitely to complacent Christians is not our mission. Freeloading Christians are straining the church's nursery and facility resources and harming the church's ability to reach the lost, says the pastor. When your bottom line is saving souls, you get impatient with people who interfere with that, good, with that goal. Faith community sent polite but firm letters to families who attend church services and freebie events, but never volunteer, never give, never volunteer, never give, and do not belong to small group or other ministry. The church estimates that only half of its regular attendees have volunteered in the past three years, and a third have never given to the church. So before now, we made people feel comfortable and welcome and tried to coax them to give a little something in return, says the staff member. That's changed. We're, we're done being the community nanny. Surprisingly, the move to disinvite people has drawn a positive response from men in the community who like the idea of an in-your-face church. Would you like to attend that church? Now, you're not going to get that letter from me. <laughs> I'm not calling anyone here freeloading Christians. As I said, this was a fictional article. Um, however, I would like us to understand that being a Christian does come with responsibility. If you look there in that one verse, in verse 20 in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible says this, Now then... We are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your command. We thank you, God, that you've loved us so much that you gave your son to die for us. Help us, God, to demonstrate that love back towards you and that we would do what you had called us to do. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There were two parts to that skit this morning. One, the part of someone who is lost, someone who has fell into sin so deep that they 
they wanted to just take their life. There's another part of that in that the responsibility of the church is to go to those who are lost. Go to those who are hurting and help them. We don't go to bash them. We don't go to beat them up. We don't go to, to bring harm to them or condemnation for we were all sinners. And those of us who know Jesus as our Savior, we've been saved by the grace of God, not because of who we are or our good works. So it, it, there is a two-part message there, and, and I hope we really get that in today as we look in this message I want us to understand that as Christians we are to be ambassadors for Christ as an ambassador for Christ we have the privilege and the duty to be to represent Christ Jesus came to establish the church he died for the church he sent his spirit to fill the church with power and he's coming back to receive the church unto himself and after his resurrection he commissioned the disciples if you've been born again if you've been washed in the blood of the lamb if you know that your name has been written in the lamb's book of life you should be a disciple of Jesus Christ and the commission is we, we find in Matthew 8 and, I mean, 28 18 through 20 that Jesus says all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and lo I am with you always even till the end of the age when we, when we read that, we begin to hear the unlimited mission that God wants us to be a part of. It's his unlimited mission. And when an unlimited God who has given us his unlimited love by supplying his unlimited atonement, and he chooses us to join in him to complete his unlimited mission, how can a born-again Christian refuse? How can we refuse this well first uh, there's two things I want us to notice throughout this and one is that there is a reality to God's unlimited mission as Christians we are to be ambassadors we can't get away from that the Bible declares that ambassadors are those who are sent out by a sender to announce the sender's message so as ambassadors of Christ, we, are no, we no longer belong to ourselves, but we belong to Christ. Do we agree with that? That you are not your own. You've been bought with a high price. As a matter of fact, 1 Corinthians 6 and 20 says, For you were bought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And as ambassadors of Christ, we, we're sent to share his message, not our message. We sometimes get worried. We sometimes get afraid. We get, we get besides ourselves because we're afraid we don't know what to say. Well, we don't have a message to share. He has a message for us to share. And if we'll just share his message, we have the words scripted out for us. They're in his holy word. Amen. As ambassadors, we've been given all authority. And all power to fulfill the mission that he sent us out to do. So we really, as a body of believers, we have no excuse. I understand that most of us deal with insecurities of some sort. As a matter of fact, my high school friends would tell you that I was the last among us that, would, that they thought would ever serve as a pastor of a church. But what I've learned is that we often sell ourselves and we often sell the power of God short. We often, we, what, what I've learned is that within ourselves, we can do nothing, but, but we have no idea what God can do with us if we're willing to allow him to work through us. Truth is, we don't know what we can do till we're faced with it. Anyone who's had to take care of a loved one while they're dying, uh, anyone who's shared their testimony with someone who's lost, who, who you've never met, can attest to you that something just takes place when you're put in those situations. Something just happens. You get strength. You get power. You get courage to stand in that moment. Oh, many of us, well, I can't do that for my mama or daddy. I, I just can't, I can't do that. I'm not a caretaker. Well, we don't know what we can do till we're forced to do it. There are things that I never thought I would have to do for my father, but I was forced to do it. We had to help. We had to be a part of it. And anyone who refuses to be a part of it, they're just acting cowardly and not trusting God. 
When someone is lost and undone and on their way to a demon's hell, and we have the message that God has placed in us to give them, and we refuse to give it because I'm afraid I'll say the wrong thing. We're acting cowardly, and we're not trusting Jesus. Oh, we can trust him. We can't trust ourselves. I can never trust myself with the message. I have notes, but I don't stay with the notes because I try to trust him and let him lead me as we speak. John 15 and 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask of the Father in my name, that he may give you. What that's helping us to see is that God has chosen us not for any good in us, but for the good he's going to place in us and the strength he's going to give us. God has saved us. He's called us with a holy calling. And he's... And this calling is not according to our works. It's not according to our strength. It's not according to our gifts and abilities. It's according to God's purpose for us and his grace to us. And folks, if we are ambassadors, what is the message we may ask? What's the message that he's given us to share? It's the message of reconciliation. Our message can be summed up as be reconciled to God. We are to implore. As we look in this verse, he says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore. I believe the King James uses a a different word there. I, I, I believe he uses the word beseech. As a matter of fact, the the word implore, it, is, it means to plead or to cry out. And we're to implore or we're to plead with others to be reconciled to God. If you want to know who's not reconciled to God, anybody that's not born again. The only way we can be reconciled to God is to be born again. And as a matter of fact, in case you didn't know, we don't have nothing to do with that. He does it all. Uh, he does it all all we're asked to do is share the message to be reconciled God does the reconciling you didn't get saved because you decided to get saved if that's the case you aren't saved we got saved because he drawed us to him it was his work and he gave us the faith to call upon him for he's given every man a measure of faith when we implore we plead with others to be reconciled we do we do it on behalf of of Christ on his behalf. King James says for Christ's sake. It's all about Christ. It's not about us. It's all about, it's not about our testimony. It's not about what we're doing. Our message has to be centered on Christ. Galatians 6 and 14, Paul went as far as to say, but God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Paul is saying, I have nothing in myself to boast about. All of my accomplishment, all the people I've led to the Lord, all the the prison cells I've been in, all the chains that's been around me, when I've been shipwrecked, when I've been been left for dead, when I've been bitten by a serpent, all these things that I've suffered, they're nothing to me. Everything's been for Christ's sake. So he had nothing he could boast in. You know, that's why I like the fact that at the cross, it's level ground. It's level ground because no one can boast No one can boast about how hard their life has been. No one can boast about what they've overcome because we can't overcome anything. He overcomes it for us. And it's him carrying us through whatever obstacle it is that we're facing. It was Jesus who gave his life. He paid the price that we couldn't pay. He died the death that we deserved. He paid the penalty of our sins. And we can never make his message about us it has to be about him and him crucified but what I want us to see in here also is there was a refusal of God's unlimited mission now I said there were two parts to this next week we're going to look at the New Testament today we're going to focus on the Old Testament and in the Old Testament we see the refusal 
of God's unlimited mission. As a matter of fact, some of you are thinking that the mission that God has given us didn't begin until Christ was getting ready to ascend back to the Father, but we're mistaken. It began in the very beginning. As a matter of fact, when, when Eve, Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, and they were, they were told, they were given instructions, be fruitful and multiply. They were to be multiplied and then being cast out of the garden was a sign for them to be scattered abroad. That might not make sense to you, but it makes a whole lot of sense to me now that I've been through this study. As a matter of fact, we remember Cain. Cain killed his brother. He dishonored God. And when he did, God put a mark on him, showing his grace and mercy that no one else would, would kill Cain. And he sent Cain to the land of Nod. You know where that is? No one else does either. It's some place that we, it's some God forsaken place. But he sent someone there who knew about the grace and the mercy of God. He meant for Adam and Eve's family to, to share with the world. As, as more came into the world about the grace and the mercy of God. He wanted them scattered, but they refused. And over time, the wickedness got so great that God decided he was going to destroy the world. And in that, he found one man who was faithful, one man who called upon him, and he called him out to build an ark. And we know the story of the flood, that God destroyed the world and saved only Noah and his family. But I want us to hear exactly what God had told Noah he gave him the same commission that he gave Adam and Eve. In, in, in Genesis 91, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Why is that so important? We, we might want to ask, why was it so important to fill the, for them to fill the earth? It was so that God's people would be all over the face of the earth. This way, all people that would come, on, uh, come into the earth would hear about the grace and the mercy of God. God want, God's mission was that all nations would come to know him. But, is, but they refused. They still refuse. Here, while this was in God's mind, it wasn't in the mind of the people. And by the time we get to chapter 11 in Genesis, what we find is that people wanted to make a name for themselves. They had a common goal. We, un we remember the story about the ba Tower of Babel. There was a common goal among the people. And, and, God, and, and their goal was that they were going to come together and make a name for themselves by making this, after they built this city, by making this tower that reached all the way to heaven. You know, having this common goal... It seemed to be a good thing. God wanted them scattered, <laughs> but they had this common goal that was preventing them from being scattered. Their common goal was that they would build this tower and make a name for themselves. So due to their collective disobedience, what God does <laughs> is he confounds their language. Listen what he didn't do. He didn't confound their tongue. He confounded their language. Because there was never a time when they could understand one another. <laughs> and because they wouldn't scatter out and share his goodness to everyone, he scattered them out. He could have destroyed them, but he chose not to. He just confounded their language and they went through all in every area of the earth. Now, th this happens a second time. We'll get to that next week. But folks, I want us to know we can't outsmart God. It may seem to us that these people were in God's will. After all, they, they had a common desire. They had a common goal. And God desires for us to love one another. And these people were on one accord. And they were accomplishing this goal. But the problem was their goal. They wanted to achieve a godlike status. They were on the same page of ignoring God. If we can't work together against God's word and disguise it as having love for one another, in order for us to love one another, we first must love the Lord. And if he must become, if we love him, then he becomes our Lord and Savior. And if he becomes our Lord and Savior, then we submit our lives to him. And then it's no longer about us. 
It's all about what he desires for us. This hadn't sunk in with the people. So God being the great initiator, he continued to initiate his mission to redeem all nations for his own glory. In other words, God was wanting every man, woman, boy, and girl to be reconciled to him. So what does he do? He calls Adam from a heathen country who served many gods and by faith, Abraham, I'm sorry, Abraham, he forsook everything that he knew and he followed God. For that, God said, I will give you a land, Abram. I will make your name great and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. I hope we really get that. I hope we really get that what God's telling Abram. He's saying to him that he's going to bless him. But he's also saying that he's going to use Abram to bless others. (laughs) Anytime God blesses us, we're to be a source of blessing for someone else. Anyone that we may encounter. God's vision is that all families of the earth be blessed through Abraham and his descendants. Genesis 12 and 3 testifies to this. When he says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. We have no right. We have no call or no duty to hoard up God's blessings to ourselves. If we love him, we will love others. If we love others, we will be a blessing to them, just as God, our Heavenly Father, who loves us, is a blessing to us. Paul tells us in Ephesians 1 and 3 that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, Israel had all of that, but tragically, for the most part, They consumed God's blessings for themselves. They didn't care about sharing them. They felt they were so superior that they were the only ones that would be God's people. So God begins to use Moses while Israel, through their disobedience, finds themselves in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. God sees Moses. And what he does with Moses is he uses him to enter into a covenant with Israel for Israel to become now a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. But this was conditional. This was God's condition that he would have them as his priests. Exodus 19, 5 through 6, the Bible says, Now therefore... If you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me. Above all people of the earth, for all the people of the earth is mine, and you shall be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In other words, he was telling them, and they missed this, that I'm going to use you to draw all the people of the earth to me. (laughs) Isn't that what priests would do? Intercede between God and man? Isn't that what pastors do, intercede between God and man? And that's what he was telling them he was going to make them a nation of. Ken Hemphill said this, Obedience is not a condition of deliverance, but a doorway to its fullness. Their obedience was to be motivated, was to be the motivation. Their obedience was to be motivated by thankfulness for what God had already done in them. It enabled Israel to enjoy both their relationship with God and their usefulness in his redemptive plan on the earth. And you know the problem we have with that is thankfulness isn't usually our motivation. Usually our motivation is fear. that We're so afraid God's going to curse us. We're so afraid that God's going to take his hand off of us. We're so afraid after we've gotten saved that God's going to, he's going to judge us and he's going to do something that we 
we fail to be thankful to him for what he's already done. And we ought to be thankful. Our thankfulness to him for what he's done for us. He left glory, come down to this sin-cursed world and gave his life for you and I. We ought to be thankful enough for him that we're motivated to serve him out of love for what he's done for us. He demonstrated that love for us. I want to tell you when we do, we find the fullness of, of, of serving him. I, I pity those people who are so afraid to, to make a mistake. They're so afraid that, that one little thing is going to keep them out of heaven. I'm sure of this. Heaven's mind is if I was already there and there's not enough devils in hell that can keep me out of heaven. And every born again Christian should feel that way. God's plan for Israel was not that he would bless them with status and prestige or even with privilege, but he wanted to use them to be a blessing to all nations. He also said, like Israel, we are not simply a possession God enjoys, but we are one he employs. <laughs> when we begin to serve the Lord... I don't know about you, but the day I got saved, scales fell off my eyes. I began to talk different. I began to walk different. I began to hear different. I began to think different. Everything changed in my life. And I'm sure it did it you. If it didn't, you need to question that I get saved. But something ought to took place that caused a change in your life. <laughs> but because of the change in our lives. The commission fell upon us. Now share this with those who are dying. Share this with those who are lost. Israel failed. They failed. Simply stated, I want us to understand, God has redeemed us not so that we're satisfied just because we're saved, but that our redemption will motivate us to share the gospel with those who are lost. Now I'm coming to a close it's never been God's intention for just Israel to enjoy God's blessings. Instead, it was always God's desire for all the nations to know him. The psalmist and the prophets seemed to get this, but the nation of Israel didn't. In Psalm 67, 1 through 2, the Bible says, God be merciful to us and bless us and cause, us, cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth that your salvation among all nations. Well, the psalmist got that. In 95, 96, in Psalm 96, 1 through 3, we hear this. The psalmist really gets that God's not only concerned about Israel, but it's concerned about everyone when he says, Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among all nations. Israel failed. They failed to respond to God's unlimited mission. They never fully understood that their role it was to expand the kingdom of God to every nation and every people. And God has now commissioned the church to respond. I want to encourage us, let's do our part. Let's continue doing our part. We're doing it. Some of you may not even be aware we're doing it. We're sending money to help missionaries. We're going on mission trips. We are, we're doing just this. Because I don't believe anyone here wants to be known or labeled as a freeloading Christian. <laughs> I don't believe anyone here wants that, desires that, or is that. So now I want to share this with you who are lost. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that God loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son. The reason that you have no peace, the reason that you have no joy, the reason that you just seem like your world's falling apart even when things look like they're doing well 
It's because you need to be reconciled to God. He's calling you to him. And the message is simple. Trust and obey. We hope you've enjoyed the message today. And if you happen to not have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, we want to invite you to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. It's as simple as the ABCs. If you would admit that you are a sinner and that you are in need of a Savior and believe that God sent his very son, Jesus Christ, to come to this earth to be the sacrifice for our sins and that he died for our sins and he arose on the third day. And then if you would confess him as your Lord and Savior, you can be saved. You must believe this with all your heart, and you must be willing to serve him. If you are, all you have to do is talk with Jesus. You don't need a preacher. You don't need a church to get saved. But if you get saved, find yourself a Bible-believing church, and I believe God will richly bless you.